live from the Washington, D.C. area, all empowered citizens need to know about intelligent use of resources, smart governance, inclusive communities, smart industry, and healthy, thriving urbanization. This is Smart Sustainability, the TV talk about shaping a sustainable future in the digital age with Nicolette Stividar. Undoubtedly, you've noticed, we live in a new world. What does that mean for leadership? Is our one leader at a time concept a thing of the past, history, hierarchy out the window? And if so, what does that mean in a democratic and social context, at work and at home, for you personally? Are we ready for democratizing leadership? Is in this new emerging world everyone a leader? And what does that mean for you? Are you ready for a new role? Democratizing leadership, our topic tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Nicolette Devidar. If you watched a movie or watch a movie from only five years ago, it feels like 50 years ago, a world long gone. At work, businesses are forced to think differently about teams, their modus operandi, how they're being managed, who's managing whom, how teams are being formed. As citizens, we're starting to think differently about what's working and no longer working. At home and also in organizations, we're realizing that the artificial thought patterns, these clean divisions into silos and who's doing what in terms of roles, is utterly useless. And in personal context, there is something inside of each and every one of us that comes more and more to the forefront in terms of becoming clearer of what you're great at, where your talents lie, and what brings out the best in you. It's as unique as you. There is no standardized approach. The essence of it all, the old ways of functioning, are no longer working. Well, they haven't for quite a while, but it took some time to recognize this at scale. Now, in a world where change happens faster than solutions, we need a, a new way of operating, a new modus operandi that can change with change. So where's leadership in this framework of explosive change? That's what we want to talk about tonight with the Honorable Henry DeCio, Global Ambassador for Changemakers. He served as COO in President Obama's 2008 presidential campaign and as Deputy Assistant to the President in the Obama White House. His latest book is a playbook for changemakers called Changemakers Playbook, where he talks about the new game and the new rules. Are you ready to play in the game of constant change? Let's find out. Henry, welcome on Smart Sustainability. Great to have you on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Your book is a fantastic read. And just to actually give you a heads up, if you haven't had a chance, go and find out. This is really a wonderful dive in in all the things that matter going forward, going into a new um, system. Now, we live in a time of I would like to call it, I mean, I know you call it explosive change. Mm. I, I used to call it exponential change. So it happens on all levels simultaneously, kind of in all different areas at once. And mm. I don't think we've really experienced this like this mm. before during history. So I'm very curious to hear about some of your experiences from the Obama lab mm. and how you started out. What were some key learning points when we were already in a new world, but nobody really had kind of recognized it yet. So to me, this sounded like you were like in the blueprint, the prototype of agile teams. Tell mm. us a little about, about from, from your key insights. Mm. What did you learn during that time? What did you find out? Yeah, well, look, I think the, the key thing is uh, my discoveries were at first in the headquarters, what I call uh, my own laboratory for discovering these new physics, mm -hmm. I didn't really understand what this meant f for the world until you know quite a few years later after I left the White House. Mm -hmm. But when I came into the Obama campaign, you know we had we grew up. I guess you'd say we we grew up you know traditionally siloed and hierarchical. I don't <laughs> know if we planned on that, but we did. I mean, he announced and. Six weeks later, you know, we're opening up headquarters for the first time. Mm -hmm. So those elevator doors open. You, we, you know, about a hundred of us, you know, spilled out onto the, that eleventh, <laughs> you know, this huge eleventh floor of a Chicago skyrise. And you know, people tearing computers out of boxes, and we're still trying to get the servers up. We've got <laughs> checks coming in the mail. We're still scrambling to get those bank accounts open. We've got yeah. checks coming. We've got phone calls coming into the reception desk. Uh, over off to the side, staffed by 
volunteers, they don't know where to send the calls because we don't know each other's names yet and right. those, the roster is shifting all the time. So when you build the airplane in mid-flight, yeah. you get sort of people into their lanes, you know, someone gets the fuselage, someone gets the, uh, you know, the, um, the, the, you know, the cockpit, the wheels, so forth. And then what you have is a series for us, a series of silos that are strung together by these, uh, you know, by these silo leaders, we call them department heads. <laughs> But we, uh, but we, you know, we come together every morning and we have a meeting of the silo leaders, and then we yeah. take our, you know, we take the uh, information back to the silos, and and what happens is, is that the silos get har harder, Nicolette. You, we don't, we start out, um, you know, um, we, we, you know, you have the, you have those tools that you need to to run your functional system. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you find out that uh, you have the sort of sucking sound sort of pulling you into your silo. For me, it was Henry, you know, can I, can I open an office? Henry, can I hire new staff? Yeah. You know, Henry, can we have some, some, uh, some money for, uh, for spending? And so what happens is all of the silo leaders are being pulled down to the responsibilities of the silo when we needed a view out and across the organization. Mm -hmm. Now, the key thing was that as we got control of the organization, things then started picking up again. Mm -hmm. You have, um, you have uh, the calendars getting faster. Uh, we had a year for the first race, but then they start becoming even days till the next races. So that runway is shorter. You have, um, you have um, a community that we've built around us that's now right on top of us. So we feel <laughs> all the, you know, all the, you know, the pressures of our stakeholders right around us. And then you have, you're always a mistake away from a PR crisis. So we had to open up and let the organization move from one leader at a time to one lead, to everyone leading in every moment. And those were the that's the biggest lesson for me. And we can explore this a little bit. But the bottom line was that um, one leader at a time, siloed, hierarchical, hierarchical people executing their skills inside the silo, people working fluidly across those old silos to pursue challenges and opportunities. Those were polar opposite systems, and that was that was my biggest discovery. So I'm envisioning a hundred people coming out of the elevator, you mm. know, full of enthusiasm, yes. full of like charged and wanting to yeah. do something. Mm. And then you probably didn't even have you didn't have clear roles or anything like this. So right. you, all you had was this tremendous resource in terms of energy, and 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 pool. And I think we would probably describe this where it sounds like it's like pure chaos. When you come, all of these people seeing out of the elevator, it's pure chaos. Absolutely. So at what point did you recognize that this, this chaos is a resource of tremendous energy that can be transformed into the powerhouse it has yeah. become? I mean, that might have been later. I mean, it, you're right. In those early days, it really is. Those are the days of hope and chaos. Yes. Um, you know, we you know we don't know each other. We don't know each other. We don't have. <laughs> we have no rules, no norms, no cultural history to guide us. Right. Um, we are. You know, I think the elbows are a little bit sharp. You know, because we're all trying to sort of uh, find our place in this uh, in this setting. He gave us. Um, he gave us. Interestingly, he gave us three pieces of guidance mm -hmm. very early that s sort of set a cultural norm for the organization. Um, one was uh, build it from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. The second was respect everyone, mm -hmm. and the third, which is the famous one, no drama. And I think That's those. I think those. Those. Uh, those pieces of guidance. You know, from build it from the bottom up, you start to have the formation, you have the foundation for that everyone stepping into their leadership kind mm -hmm. of thinking. Um, you know, respect everyone. I think that uh, the ability to have empathy and to work together and then no drama, which is, you know, check your check your ego and at the door and put, the, you know, put your tool, your skills and capacities to work for the good of the mission. Mm -hmm. But that, that to me though, so this is really sounds to me like the, the, the prototype, what you've experienced is the prototype of self-forming teams. Mm. So there is a dynamic, obviously, that you've witnessed that mm. comes into place, which could be called, some call it the invisible hand. So when we actually let teams work mm. and let people work to the best of their abilities, there's a different dynamic that comes into place. And as you said, you mentioned before, as we got control of the organization. So how much control mm -hmm. was necessary and how much control did you just go with the flow and things <laughs> developed in a self, you know, self-developing, self-forming way? Right. I mean, it's a great point. Look, 
this wasn't my choice. You know, this shift wasn't my choice. Campaigns, we're, um, we're pretty risk averse. Yeah. And we kind of, uh, you know, historically, <laughs> they have sort of a campaign, sort of a, uh, um, you know, command and control mm -hmm. sort, sort of system. You want the candidate to have the freedom to, you know, to do what they need to. You don't want your organization to get too risky. So, uh, so to your point, though, um, as things started to move faster and faster, I think what happened was we were we were kind of forced into this. Now, on the one hand, we did have that cultural framework, but that also did mean that we started hiring people that could fit into that kind of framework. I think so. We had a we had a more um, agile individual that was yeah. coming into our organization, yeah. and then I think as things just became, you know, we, it wasn't like we had a staff meeting and said we need to do this differently. I think we were just forced into this kind of change because it was happening so fast. So that period, you know, when things are happening fast, I call it change on stairs. We're from hope and chaos to change on steroids and we were sort of pushed into it. Yeah, but you know what I find really interesting and I think mm. that's where so many lessons we can learn from is when you have the pressure, you have the you know the time yeah. pressure, the very time window, everyone's in there. It's kind of like you're all throwing in the water and you start to swim and everyone yeah. digs out like what's the rhythm they can swim with, mm. where can they go with and things like that. Now, contrast that mm. to regular organizations, hierarchy, vertical, mm. you know, top down, all these nice little elements in place. How, when did you realize that this was a completely different game? Uh, well, it was probably right around, look, we, in the first 16 months, we went from 100 staff to about 2,000 staff. And that the, alone I find actually unbelievably it was, challenging, we had, seriously. So, yeah, I mean, we, 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 we went from a mom and pop shop Yes. to Walmart in 21 months. I mean, we scaled into something really huge. Yeah. But in those first 16 months, zero, uh, 100, we went from 100 to uh, 2,000 staff. In the last 16 weeks, we went from 2,000 to 6,000 staff. And we went from $40 million a month revenue to $100 million a month in those last 16 weeks. So we, that was when it really came became clear to me. We'd been working in this sort of much more fluid, sort of fluid, open, fluid, integrated kind of system mm -hmm. for, uh, for, for longer than I noticed, to be honest. Uh, but it really, I really woke up to it when I thought, wow, how are we going to scale? How are we going to take in all these other change makers? Yeah in this system that is uh, that is moving so fast and so fluid. From my point of view as the COO, I thought we were, I, I was certain I was, you know, we were going to lose this election um, on, on, on the organization at that point. We'd been, we'd been known, <laughs> yes. right, for our organization, innovative and disciplined, but I didn't see how we could scale that fast. So on some level, that's when I realized that we were going to have to, on some level, we we're going to have to help people into this organization as change makers, not try to control it against it. Yeah, and I, I think that's the key point. But when you contrast this with regular organizations, mm. I think there's an enormous piece of trust that you put in people that would literally just, um, that's really kind of the, the, the key threshold, mm. I think, which a lot of organizations are struggling with. Very clearly, we made a shift from a permission-based system, remember the Henry Kenai, to the to a to to a, a system that was based on on um, on trusting individuals. Mm -hmm. It meant that I had to know that you were going to handle your change responsibly. You had to know that I was going to handle my change responsibly. And so, in that context, uh, you know, I think there was I think there was a, a clear shift, and this became empathy based ethics empathy-based leadership and action, that became the, the foundation. So if you think about it this way, uh, we, uh, there were three very big lessons, I think, that, that, I, that, that came to me as we were going through this pivot. Uh, on the one hand, everyone had to step into their bigness. Hmm. Now, to your point... What do you mean by that, everyone had to step into their bigness, oh, like in yeah. what they feel like they're best at, or just get, getting larger than they thought they could be? Yeah, I think people had to be more than their job titles and their job responsibilities, right? right? You had to also be as big as your possibilities. 
uh, and uh, the things that you could do even beyond your job description. And so that was a very key thing. In the old way of working, mm. uh, one person big, everyone else small in any moment, that hierarchical system. Mm. This, what we were trying to do, I mean, we were going against Hillary Clinton, who was a very well-known, you know, uh, well-funded brand in politics. Yeah. Then you have the Republican Party, which is also very uh, large. So we yeah. weren't going to do this by people staying inside their job descriptions. They were going to have to really um, have self-permission to tear down walls and to and to expand uh, uh, the mission. The second big takeaway was mm -hmm. that innovation wasn't really, um, you know, people think of the Obama campaign as being innovative for our use of social media mm -hmm. or for technology. Yeah. Yeah. But in fact, it wasn't the hottest, newest piece of technology that made the difference here. It was actually a, the ability of people to tear down walls yeah. and bring two or more sites together that wouldn't otherwise connect. And empower them to tear down the wall. What you said, I think, is really a key exactly. to not having to ask for permission but knowing people knew that they could do it so they, they were empowered in a way to do what they thought was the right thing to do right and they did it they did yes. it. I mean what was happening was walls were coming down everywhere all the time yeah. uh, and so now that system is explosive and omnidirectional right so mm -hmm. what was happening is as those walls are coming down what we start to see is that innovation is happening everywhere and this makes this is a different kind of change that than that that siloed hierarchical everyone doing their their thing linearly faster yeah uh, so that was the second big uh, takeaway the third big takeaway was and and this is to this point uh, if everything you change changes everything mm -hmm. and everyone is doing it then you're in a, a new a very different kind of change that's going on around you so you would have thought we would by opening up the organization we'd sort of wrestle those change forces to the ground in fact change got faster and it was more explosive uh, and so what happened then yeah. was we had uh, people had to be able to continue to try to innovate into the change not try to control it and, and, and hold it back and that's what I mean, I think, very much by the self-dynamic, because this is when you really let go and where, where you stop the controlling part and it kind of exponentially takes mm -hmm. off. And I think this is what we overlook very often today in organizations where you have so many organizations that say, we want to transform, we want to adapt to change, we want to go faster, etc. Mm. but you have to let go at some point. I think that's right, but that's not natural. That's no, not a it's natural not. thing. That's not no. what we've been taught. No. So, uh, so I think I think that's right. I think that's when I started to realize as we we're bringing more people in, that we we're going to have to be able to help the people coming in to understand the norms mm -hmm. of how we work, and people who are receiving them also to make sure. What happened was um, mm -hmm. that when everyone is is a leader. Hmm. Everyone is a stakeholder. And when everyone is a stakeholder, everyone is a steward. And so what happened was in those last days, we didn't have one piece of rogue activity. Not a bad hire, not an unusual office opening, you know, weird purchases. So at the end of the day, um, what we found was it did move to a very much a trust-based system yeah. where the community organized and shepherded itself to the end. I want to talk about everyone a leader, but before mm. we go into everyone a leader, let's talk a little bit about leadership, the new definition mm. of leadership that mm -hmm. we're looking at. Because when, when we talk about everyone a leader, how does that fit into our traditional concept of mm. or idea of leadership? Mm. Well, I can tell you what it was for me. I think yeah. I'm pretty, um, you know, when I went into the Obama campaign, I would have described myself as a mentoring leader, mm -hmm. uh, an inclusive leader, somebody who, you know, encouraged uh, everyone around me to step into their mm -hmm. leadership. But if I'm honest, I would also say that I, you know, I think that I, you know, I was also very much influenced by that one leader at a time framework that I think most of us carry. So yeah. it's one I had in school. It was the one I got in my history books. It's the one that my dad told me about. You're either, uh, you know, somebody has to be in charge in any moment, and that person yeah, is the that's, leader. Yeah, that's right. And, and so he was very clear yeah. I needed to be one, you know, I, I needed to be the leader one. But you were either one or the other. And, uh, but so, so um, I, you know, while I may have been an enlightened leader, I think that was my bias uh, okay. still. And so um, I think that, you know, as we look, as, as we went through this shift from one leader at a time, to everyone leading in every moment, what I found was that the physics of leadership mm -hmm. were completely flipped on the were completely flipped uh, uh, upside down. So again, in the old game, one person big, everyone else small. Yep. In the new game, everyone stepping into their bigness. 
in the old game, functional teams. Yep. In the new game, uh, working like you said earlier around those sort of around those silos to to work uh, more fluidly across those old silos. And uh, thinking beyond your role and beyond your being not absolutely. you know molded like pigeonholed in. Well, that's right because then what you also have you no, know, it's a great point because in the new game, mm. in the old game, uh, you know it was one one leader at a time. In the new game, everyone has to see the big picture, mm -hmm. and act. No one can be passive. Um, in the old game, therefore, you gave out information on a need-to-know basis, but in the new game, everyone has to have all the information to act. Yeah. It just goes back and forth, uh, as you've said already, uh, permission-based, trust-based, yeah. uh, inclusion uh, or exclusion, inclusion. Yeah. Um, all, so the physics of leadership then, even authoritative voice, coaching voice, everything mm -hmm. was polar opposite as you move from one system to the other. Yeah, and I think this is the challenge. And I actually do want to pick this up because you heard Henry just say when he said everyone has to be active, you cannot be passive. Mm. That is something that I think we all need to wake up to, to this new reality because we are already in a new system. But I think that many people, can it be that many people have not recognized yet that we all are already in a new game and a new system and hence have trouble with that? I think you've hit the. I think you've hit this spot on because uh, I. Th my feeling is is that we can all play in this new game. The challenge yeah. is we don't see this game so clearly. And I usually I use this. Uh, I use this example of the football player running out on the field. <laughs> right, he's prepared his whole life for the game. He's got the big heavy padding and the big helmet. Charges out there, gets out on the field to see the other players, and then suddenly. The two steel spires are down, these two nets are up, yeah. the players don't have the same heavy gear that he has, they have light clothing, flowing hair, they're chasing after a very different football. What do you do when the game is changed? The yep. game, and this is a game you prepared for your whole life, right? So yep. one possibility is you're, you're frozen, and I think we see a lot of this. You're frozen in place, you don't know what to do, push to the sidelines. Mm -hmm. The second possibility is you'll double down. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of this, double down on what you've been trained to do, tackling those players in the light clothing and the flowing hair to the ground, again, you'll be pushed to the sidelines. The third thing is to get into this new game. So you gotta take off that heavy gear, you've gotta work new muscles, you're gonna have to bring uh, new players onto your team that know how to play, you've gotta bring your existing players up along uh, with them, um, you're gonna need a new, to know the new rules for the new game, yep. and you're gonna need a new playbook. Yes, and the playbook that's been handed on from generations on how to play the game of repetition making <laughs> won't out the serve window. us in the game of change making. <laughs> yeah, I, I find this really interesting. So when we go from this old traditional leadership concept to everyone a leader, mm. what does that mean though for us in everyday life? Mm. Let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. So, Everyone a leader, and that's really a big step. I mean, this is the polar opposite. So we need to we need to almost do exactly the opposite of what everyone has been. Well, most, most a lot of people have been doing. Yeah. What does that mean for us? For example, when we think about ourselves as everyone's a leader, I'm sure mm. you hear people all the time that would say, "Well, somebody has to make the final decision or mm. something." But if we think along those lines, what does that mean for us personally? Let's start with on an individual level. Let's start mm. with that and then work up. Yeah, well, first of all, in the campaign, you know, my laboratory, going back to my laboratory, mm -hmm. um, I thought I had a management discovery. Yeah. So I didn't know this meant something outside of the campaign, con the, the headquarters context. Um, now, w to be clear, we didn't go from, to, you know, we didn't, we weren't everyone the leader. Mm -hmm. Right, we were everyone a leader. A leader, yeah. So we didn't go flat. This wasn't about yeah. losing hierarchy altogether. Yeah. But it did mean that everyone viewed themselves differently in this new context. Yeah. Now, as I came out into the world after the White House, two and a half years in the White House, um, fresh eyes, rested spirit, this new lens on leadership, what I discovered was was a surprise to me. Mm -hmm that the world had made a change, um, really feel, felt like well during that time that I was away. But that same thing, that change maker effect, if everything you change changes everything and everyone is doing it, that's what I saw in the world. We had rising individual agency. We had yeah. these tools at our fingertips now, the, the tools of change that were once available to a few. Yeah. Uh, I, could, I had my printing press. 
I had my, I could be a retailer in a moment. I could be a first responder. When I was a kid, you'd put a di you know, dime in the uh, uh, payphone and uh, you know, uh, emergency responders would come. Now I'm part of the first responder equation. And so what I realized was that the world now had made this pivot uh, to um, the shift into the change maker effect and that was affecting how all of us were living and working. And it mm -hmm. does mean that it means something very different for us as individuals now. Yeah, but I think that really re requires one important thing that we all recognize that everything is connected with everything. And I think this is also a big part of the how we see the new framework of the leadership. Mm. Like you said, there is this huge transparency. Everybody has to be like in the feedback loop all the time. You cannot right. just know like fragmented things, but you need to know all of this. But I think it also comes from understanding that when you see the big picture and you do like the big puzzle and you know when mm. let's say like that, that there is a piece loose up here for example you know then you know everything else might be affected by that right. in a positive sense mm. you could also say if we change a little bit up here then naturally if we think about the big picture everything else needs to change but because we've been so siloed and I think everyone has in mm -hmm. the last what hundred years yeah. um, it's really hard to look outside that that little tunnel and see how these things are coming together are we not teaching in schools and things like that to think interconnected well is this something we need to work on i i, I think it's it's a, it's essential in the new game mm -hmm. i can't i don't know if it's being in school if it's being you know if it's part of schools now or it's being left out but i will say mm -hmm. this it's um it's a much bigger thing, what you're bringing up, than mm -hmm. what I think we've been oriented to. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, in the old game, again, the polar opposite physics, uh, the leader would point the way mm -hmm. and, and expect people to follow. That was that 2020 vision. To your point, in the new game, you have to have 360 vision. Yeah. You have to know how your change is affecting someone else's change. And I have to yeah. know that you're being responsible with your change. That's and right. you want to know that I'm being responsible with mine. So I yeah. think there is, I think there is, so that makes empathy now the foundational skill in this new game. The old soft skill is now the new hard skill. Yeah. Um, and so I do think we have to do a lot more with our kids yeah. in helping them understand and learn and master empathy at a very young age because that's gonna be the cornerstone for how they live and work in this new system. Where, by the way, rule makers can't keep up with the pace of change. I know that <laughs> from my own experience in my campaign laboratory. Rule make, I like that. So I, I actually, I like breaking rules because it's just a natural, mm. you know, it's for some people, I guess it's just a natural part, more natural part of the DNA. Mm. So then you go a little bit easier with the flow. But I think if the last year, even with COVID taught us anything, it's that mm. everyone has has a responsibility to step up the game a little bit and mm -hmm. think about well how can I make things work without the the, the milestones the, the the backdrop that we used to have and things like that mm. is that the case yeah well I love so going back to your example about kids right mm -hmm. uh, my, my kids are now 12 13 and 12 but when they entered kindergarten we knew that 65 percent of job types they would assume at year 12 or 16 didn't yet exist yep yet we still have them on an assembly line to everyone a vocation. So at year 12 or 16, you're gonna graduate with skills to have a job. That's right. The reality now is that kids need to have experiences that take them to everyone a change maker. So how do we need to think about yeah. that system that comes from our days of repetition differently? We have a lot of change makers in education, by the way, teachers, ed uh, educators generally, um, but we do have a system that was born from generations, the you know the skill didn't want change makers. They wanted you know that's right. Th no thinkers at all. Actually, if we're honest, correct. Like yeah. the, the days of Ben Franklin, the craft, yeah. Henry Ford's assembly line. So that's one thing. Now, now right. if you fast forward into COVID, I really think um, this is, this has been a tough time. Yeah. Certainly difficult. I know what it's been like for my kids. Yes. I'm also very hope and changeful about this generation. Because this is the generation, this, this is the generation that we're sort of, I don't know, framing as the lost generation. They've lost something really big. Yeah. I think this is going to be remembered as the resilient generation. This is the generation that's been able to go come home, uh, you know, separate from their friends and their activities immediately. Yeah. They've gone back and forth. They've had uh, two sets of bosses, the one on their screen, the teacher, the one over their shoulder, the parent. They've been able to navigate this period of a year in a way that I think is going to give them empathy, mm -hmm. um, the way to learn collaborative teamwork, 
the way to um, to step into their leadership mm -hmm. during this time. They've had to innovate. We've all had to innovate to get through it, and then to be able to put their capacities to work for the good of all uh, at a time when we've really needed to come together. Mm -hmm. So I really feel um, I'm very um, I'm very hope and changeful about this generation, even understanding all the challenges that they've had. You know, there's a really interesting thing what you just said because when when we look at this, so our kids now they grow up basically with no yes there are covid rules if you want to mm. call them rules but other than that they're not being indoctrinated with the same rules that we all learned mm. when you came up so when i do an analogy to when you started at the at the campaign mm. with an organization that basically started with no rules also True. so You've, you've seen how well this worked when you go with the flow, you bring out your best and, and things like that. So maybe for you that's a little easier because you've experienced it mm. and you can see that this is a, this is a great way of, of actually bringing out the best and developing forward and going forward. Whereas for some others, it may be, may be a little bit more difficult to understand that, well, what do I do if I don't have rules? Yeah, yeah, look, I love that observation. I, I will say, Nicolette, I'm, I'm very, you know, I, I very much see the new game. Mm -hmm. And one of the, again, if we go back to that football player, if you see it, yep. you can get into it. But I think one of the challenges is we haven't really had, Seen it. we don't have the clarity that, that no. the football player has. I mean, no. it's very clear something has changed there. We know that change is happening. We feel it underneath the, the, the earth shifting beneath our feet. Yeah. But we don't exactly know what it is. And so I'll say it again because I think it's so important. The world of repetition gave us linear, faster change. But even Henry VIII was complaining about the speed of change in his day. There's nothing <laughs> unique about that. The reality is, is that now we have everyone in the change game. Leaders make change. It's just what we do. And now we are leading. We, when I go out into the world and I say, I don't care if I go into a boardroom or a big auditorium <laughs> or a second grade class, yeah. innovative mind, service heart, entrepreneurial spirit, collaborative outlook, who here is that? All hands go up. And if you put the tools of change along with that, mm -hmm. and you have movements which are tearing down silos, you have the democratization of leadership, we are now in a whole new game. And if we can see that new game and the new nature of change, I'm totally convinced we can get into that game. I agree, but I want to talk about mm. the, the democratizing leadership for a moment. Mm. I know we've talked a little bit about the difference. W what's the difference between the old traditional leadership and the new leadership? We talked about what does it mean to be an everyday leader. Mm. Let's talk about and clarify what's the democratizing leadership part for organizations mm. and then also in terms of what does that mean for us in a social context. So when we talk about those are pretty big words, you know, mm. democratize is a big word. And then we yeah. talked about the leadership. Let's talk about the democratize. How would you describe the word democratize if you had to explain mm. it in a few adjectives or so? How would you how do you see it? Well, I mean, I just think it's what we're doing now that we don't notice. Yeah. So when I came out, for example, again, back in this 2011, 2012, kids were our kids were little. There was a game that was being played on the playground where I, I could see it every day it was happening. My wife could see it. Other parents could see it. Mm -hmm. um, kids running away from one, one or two particular kids. And it, it, was, it, was a, it, you know, it wasn't a healthy game. Mm -hmm. um, now, you would say this, the principal is in charge of the school. The teacher might be in charge of the playground, whatever's going on. But the reality was that the parents saw it. Uh, got on email together and said, we've got to stop this. Everyone's talked to their kids. And then the next day, the game was done. We never saw it again. The only thing we had to do then was tell the person in charge uh, what had happened and how we took care of it so that they could, they could spot it in the future. We're now in each other's business now. We now, you know, you have still a principal over a school. You still have the mayor over the city, the CEO and the organization. But we're all now moving across those old silo boundaries with mm -hmm. the tools of change. The empowerment era is here, and we're now all working together to solve these problems. We just don't notice it. So that's what I, when, when I think of democratization of leadership, I just mean we're all living it every day, even if we still, still see those old silos. Uh, and and we're just uh, we're just working across those old silos to make the change, and then we're usually informing the leaders about what happened. Okay, so in a social context mm. and also in a democratic context, mm. for example, what does that look like? Are we then all decision makers in everyday life? 
Well, we uh, look. I I got here without any trouble. I used to, you know, I used to be a disaster trying to get from point A to point B in my car. Now, you know, I have a GPS tool. I have. I don't have to get out a big map. I don't have to do all those things. Um, we're now used to being able to um, live our lives as change makers. Yeah. And now what that means is we need a system. We need systems that accommodate that. So we talked about the football player. He's also going to need a whole new stadium. Because that old stadium is not going to work for the new game, and so what we now have are uh, we have mindsets, we have frameworks, we mm -hmm. have um, systems that are still in service to the game of repetition. Yeah. And when a change maker comes to work, and they come to a siloed hierarchical organization, that's they like putting a long. that's right. <laughs> it's like putting a tiger in a cage, right? That's right. So it doesn't work out very yeah. well, and that was what happened for us. We had change makers in our organization, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and we and they just kind of pushed us into this new game, right? So uh, I think as we see now a new generation that's coming in, that is a change maker generation. It's the it's going to be the onus is going to be on our young people to change all the, the we got the change maker part now. It's the systems the mindsets, the frameworks that help us play in this new game. That's what the new generation is going to contribute. But you mentioned three really important words. Mm. So we have to start thinking in terms of systems, something that we haven't done before. We mm. know now that there are ecosystems, and we know systems function differently from whatever this old construct was, yeah. that linear construct that yeah. we know is so artificial and so not usable for a non-linear world. Mm. So we have to start thinking in terms of systems, we have to start thinking in terms of mindsets, we have to start thinking in terms of frameworks. Mm. Now, for normal people, how would you explain the difference between a framework and a system? Well, a framework is, I think, bigger than a system. It's, mm -hmm. it's a sort of the how we do things and the system is the delivery part mm -hmm. of it, right? Um, so, for example, um, when I realized that my kids were on an assembly line to everyone a vocation, yeah. I knew that I was going to have to step up as a parent to help prepare them for this new game. Uh, now, I started looking at change makers past and present, so mm -hmm. Florence Nightingale, Abraham Lincoln, some of those <laughs> folks, but I also looked at uh, some of the world leading social entrepreneurs I'd been working with at Ashoka for seven years, yeah. uh, the organization I worked with. And what I found was there were four common things that change makers had in their learning that were important to prepare them for the new game. One was empathy. Mm -hmm. Uh, empathy before the age of seven particularly. Children, that's when they're most open yeah. to learning. That's when adults can role model it. That's, yeah. by the way, what Florence Nightingale's mother did. It's what Abraham Lincoln's, both his mother and stepmother did. And yeah. so modeling empathy, learning empathy at a young age. The second, so what could I do with my kids to help them have experiences to learn and, um, and master empathy. Then as, uh, so that was partly in school, but encouraging them in school to different things, but also mm -hmm. things that um, we did at home. The second thing was the change maker um, learns around their passion between the ages of seven and 12. Now, oftentimes that's when adults are telling kids to stop doing what they're doing. Like, don't do that, I told you to do this. And so yeah. kids learn around their passion at an age when we're usually, they're trying to get their own identities at that age. So, uh, so how, yeah. you know, I could find ways, uh, my wife and I could find ways as parents to help our kids encourage them around their passions to learn all the way uh, with, with different aspects than just sort of what they're doing. Not mm -hmm. just kick a soccer ball, but also interview them, put them on an Apple phone, then show them their interview on TV after their game. Yeah. Um, the third thing is teens form, uh, learn how to form teams around their ideas. And then they're learning to work collaboratively, collaboratively as co-leaders in that project. And then the fourth thing is um, change makers leave to learn. They, they generally leave their comfort zone. Sometimes it's yeah. their zip code. Yeah. Sometimes I it's their area of comfort. Sometimes it's the other side of the world. Yeah. And those four things can serve us for life. Yeah. So uh, so now you now I can take ownership and say, okay, yeah. I've got more to do here. Here are the things that I can add into my child's learning in addition yeah. to what they're learning at school. Yeah, but that that really does put all of our traditional thinking in terms of how we hire people, what kind of people you hire, how we treat people once you're in an organization. Totally, yes. it, it totally flips it because when you what you just described is the self-forming aspect of teams when they they build teams around ideas. That's when you mm. let go of the reins and and they kind of start developing. But what we still have in many organizations is you have your job descriptions yeah. and you kind of pigeonhole in there and and you're cemented to make sure that you actually don't mm. think outside the walls. Right. So 
what would you advise to organizations and to, I don't really want to use the word leaders in the organizations mm. because now we're talking in a context of everyone being a leader. Mm. So how do you get out of that mold and step into your power of being a leader and, mm. and, and expanding your presence, if you want. So, so I, I can tell you in organizations, if, if you go in or if somebody goes in and says, well, I'm going to expand my presence, so there are going to be 10 people say, you're stepping on my terrain. Right. So how, how, do you how do we navigate that? Well, I think I'm sure you have this in your experience, too, where it really a lot, I find when you have people at that top of that system, right, mm -hmm. that see this new game they really do they want to encourage everyone um, yeah. in in a very different way and what i find is those those ceos those managers mm -hmm. they tend to they tend to create learning systems mm -hmm. instead of um, fear of failure systems yeah that's um, a good and point. so as you're learning together about how to because we look we don't know how to play in this new game no we don't but it's never been more important for business we've got businesses failing faster <laughs> We've got, you know, we've got um, uh, big brands that were with us for, you know, decades going away. Yeah. Um, so now we know that this new strategic landscape is fast, fluid, hybrid. So you have to have change makers. Change makers have to be able to learn together um, and, and share experiences together. So mm -hmm. a very different meeting, by the way, yeah. than what you would have had in the past. Not my old meeting where, right, the silo leaders came together and sort of took the instruction back to the silo. And even in our case- Filtered right, in most filtered cases, out, right? right? Yeah. In, in our case, we even started having, we started curating, like, what are you learning? What, the, that meeting became a, cura a, a meeting of curating information. Yeah. Trying to figure out how to ride into, you know, the, the wave um, of our, that was being created by our change makers. Same thing today on the, uh, for a business uh, leader. And so as you start to see these new physics kind of come into play and the new leaders figuring out how to play in this new game, they'll all take, they can take their staff into, these new, into the new game. And I would say one other thing, uh, if you think about it, the old leader was more, again, a terrible sports analogy, but the old leader was more like the quarterback, that person who got the ball, gave the ball to someone else, handed it to someone else. Now the leader has to be more of that coach close mm -hmm. enough to the field of play to be able to see what's going on, but you really are relying on everyone on the field mm -hmm. executing their leadership together. And I think that when we start to see um, uh, business leaders starting to understand the new strategic landscape, how to mm -hmm. play, they can bring their teams into this new game. Mm -hmm. Where does vision play a role in all of that? Mm -hmm. So what do I mean? So when you had like an organization prior in the old system, you knew that vision was absolutely centric for everything. So whoever yeah. was the leader, you needed to have a vision or you couldn't rally your team. Yeah. Now in this fast developing world where, my God, vision can change so quickly because you know right. the landscape has changed, or, right. they change so quickly. How does vision play a role? I mean, for me, what I think was, was helpful for us was that we saw change makers. We were interacting mm -hmm. with the universe of change makers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think more and more um, stakeholders, the, key, the, the leaders are going to have to see that the stakeholders now uh, mm -hmm. are change makers. And you have to then build your organization to accommodate change makers mm -hmm. and change making. And so, that, so it's moved from vision to values because mm -hmm. change makers are, are motivated by values. And mm -hmm. so you've got to be able to align your values with the universe that's there. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we find then is that um, if you're a teacher and you see change makers coming through your door and not mm -hmm. students, how would you build it differently? Mm -hmm. If you are uh, parents and you see change makers in your household, uh, and not your kids. How would you build that system differently? If you're a business person and you see uh, change makers coming through your doors and not customers, mm -hmm. how would you build that differently? Or a civic leader, if you see change makers and not taxpayers, you would start building a more open, fluid, integrated system that allows for learning, that allows for, uh, for people to step into their bigness together right. and, and uh, pursue challenges and opportunities together. Let's define for a second who's a change maker. How would you mm. define a change maker? Who can consider him, themselves a change maker? How would you define that? Well, it's hard to define, but for me, again, I go back to that very initial sort of definition, innovative mind, yeah. service heart, entrepreneurial spirit, collaborative outlook. That is how we self-identify now. 
So if we self-identify uh, that way and we have the tools that allow us to act in ways like never before, mm -hmm. the key is now to see that new game, to see that new universe, and then build your, go back, we're going back to now framework change. Build yeah. your systems, your frameworks, your mindsets to be able to accommodate that. But again, in, the, in this new, if you just take business for a minute, in this new world where a change is, uh, is explosive and omnidirectional, and that's your business strategic landscape, yeah. then the new KPI is how many of our people are change makers. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's the same thing in my household. If, if I know right. that my, the world my kids are going into is a change maker world, then that's my KPI as well. Yeah, I, I, I think I definitely think this is a very, very essential point. Now, you mentioned something earlier, which I want to pick up here for a mm. second. How do we start in a civic sense to to um, change uh. seeing a a well see people as change makers or see citizens as you want as mm. change makers versus taxpayers? Yeah. Now, that to me is a fundamental shift in thinking in a civic sense. Yes. How do we get there? Yeah, I, again, you got to see the new game and you've got to speak to that new game. We've got to talk about a world now mm. where problems are outpacing solutions. Mm. Uh, and we're going to need everybody to step into their bigness and come together around those problems and opportunities. Again, the requisite new leadership skill in this new game, tearing down walls, bringing two or more sides together that wouldn't otherwise connect, that's mm. when innovation happens. And so now, if you're a civic leader, you have to start moving into a space of moving people together around challenges and opportunities, showing where the, where the cha challenges are and, and helping people see that they can solve uh, big complex problems together like never before. Mm. And so it is really about activating people, harnessing people, I think you said earlier, mm. in harnessing that energy toward the good of all. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is that is the new responsibility for every civic leader now. And and you know it was hard because sometimes it's not just them. Sometimes it's like I gave you taxes, you just do my roads, right? <laughs> so th there are change makers in the civic space, but sometimes uh, our mindsets sort of hem us in. Yeah, they do, and I think those are the hardest to change is the mindsets mm. to start thinking about this. But I think if we go intentional, if we talk more about this, and we're more intentional in terms of seeing everyone as a change yes. maker, and that means also that you understand that you're a change maker, and not just wait for a leader at top to give mm. you some instructions, but get out of the reactive state into a creative state, that's when we actually collectively tap into this humongous pool of power that we haven't tapped into yet. Right, and that's, so that goes right to the heart of the book, Changemaker Playbook. Yeah. It's literally story after story after story of everyday citizens seeing a challenge and then bringing people together around that challenge and not waiting. And so one example is Molly yeah. Barker. Molly Barker, she's a North Carolina mom mm -hmm. back in late 90s, and she believed that young women were being defined into what she called the girl box. Uh, by society before young girls uh, between 8 and uh, 12 years old had a chance to define themselves. Yeah. So she took 12 girls on a run. She had two things she wanted to do. One was m mentor them, just help them get in touch with their emotions during this time, this, this time in their lives. Yeah. The second was to help them train for a, for a distance running uh, event. Yeah. And what happened then was uh, over the course of uh, that time together, that training period, the young women developed a sense of self, they developed a sense of their physical abilities, and then um, they had confidence as young women coming into this new world. Now here we are, um, I don't know, that's, I think that organization started in 1998, here we are in 2021, more than two million women have gone through that program all over the world, uh, certainly all over the country in different parts of the world. So this is now uh, somebody who was just an everyday mom who decided to step into her bigness do something for young women, and now a whole generation of women have grown up happily outside of that girl box. Yeah, that which is absolutely wonderful. Now, you mentioned in your book something about framing or claim your own frame. So here's mm. what I want to get to. So when we think of ourselves as everyone is a leader, everyone is a change maker, mm. we live in a different framework, you define your frame. Obviously, you know, the, 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 the mom in North Carolina defined her game and her frame extremely yeah. well and it resonated with her purpose. Mm. What would you explain to people or advise to people how does someone claim 
their frame. Yeah, well, so we spend a lot of time on, the, on this in the book, a whole chapter on that, because mm -hmm. uh, it is true that the world's leading change makers, so these are the most highly effective change makers, they yeah. place a very high premium on definition. Yeah. And I, I was already in tune to this from, go, again, going back to my campaign, there was about four staff um, who were referred to as the travel bookers. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't really a very glamorous title. Now, the reality <laughs> was is that they were four in the whole scheme of like, if you even think hierarchical, <laughs> they were at the very lowest rung of the lowest rungs. I mean, they were right on the front line and really handling the toughest challenges. Yeah. Probably four of the most innovative people in this whole campaign of 6,000 people that I was talking about. And what would happen is, is that if, you know, among their responsi many responsibilities or actually uh, ac actions that they took, um, they were, uh, if you wanted to book travel in the campaign, you could, we had a tool that you could do this, it was a little innovative back in 2007, you could book, but you, you actually had to talk to one of these four individuals. Mm -hmm. And they didn't tell you what to do, but they would tell you um, what, you know, you might, how to change your travel behavior that might save the campaign money or maybe give you some more time and so forth. They actually gave me a report in dollars and cents, they measured their leadership in dollars and cents. And it, after 16 months, going into the last 16 weeks, they had saved enough money through their interventions yeah. to run a small state on that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to play in. These were not travel bookers. These were people who were shaping the culture of our organization, gave us our frugal outlook, but also our innovative nature. They were, um, they were innovative mind, service heart, entrepreneurial spirit, collaborative outlook in action and they were um, assistant chief financial officers, if you want to really uh, give them a better title. Mm -hmm. And so um, this idea that you can really be defined into your smallest box, yeah. like Molly was talking about before she founded Girls on the Run, um, it really happens to all of us. We're always being defined by you know, our job titles, our responsibilities, maybe our, you know, the kind of car we drive or the neighborhood we're from. And we yeah. really need to be bigger than how we are defined. And so it's a conscious thing of change makers to constantly push back against the frame. Which also means actually we should probably ditch some of our resumes. I used to say it's really interesting to read the things that are not in the resume. I don't yes. want to read all the stuff in the resume. It's the stories in between from That's someone. That's right. Oh, I totally agree with you. The resume is so old game. Ah. The titles and the labels Everything. and the measurements, all the old scoring it's from like, the old game. Exactly, Absolutely. like this is your roadmap, and you know what do you do with this roadmap? You toss it out. I 100% agree with you. Which is actually what, what, let's talk a little bit, so we have about six minutes left. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the new rules and some of the old rules to ditch out. So if we yeah. kind of do it like some, some of the ones that maybe right. we talk really about the resume one that really ditch it out. But, yeah. but let's talk about what would you say, what are old rules that just need to get off the shelf? Okay, all right, let's do this. You do one and then I'll do one and then, <laughs> then we'll go back and forth. Okay. Do you want to start? Okay, well, I started with the resume. All right, um, that was a good one. Okay, let me, let's see. The, the resume is one. I would also, actually, I think we need to ditch the job descriptions. Yeah. Because I they are be. too much cementing people in holes versus yeah. actually centering, making a job centric around the person, who they are and their talents, which of course means the person needs to really understand what they're good at and what their talents are and what their skills are. Right. I and like not that. take it defensive when they're being asked about, well, what are your skills, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You have to own your skills to claim your space. I'm with that. I'm with you on that. I think uh, I'll bounce off that a little bit too. I think the um, once a year evaluation by your supervisor has got to go. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, Long overdue. Yeah. Um, yeah. So okay, your turn. Go. Give, <laughs> let's do one which, more round. Yeah, which means performance management. So performance management in general is kind of out the window too because who's going to set the goals in a world that's constantly out of change? Mm. How are you going to set the goals if you don't have ongoing conversations and right. give the person the room and the, the trust that they know what needs to be done and how to achieve a goal? Right. And then I would add to that, I think, in, I think information sharing has got to, the, the, the staff meeting has got to, to change yeah. from a sort of what will you do experience to what have we learned experience. Yeah. Because I think um, as we start to learn together and see the new strategic landscape together, we can then crowdsource ideas together into how to do that mm -hmm. as well.
I, I like that a lot. Now, I want to talk very briefly mm. about, you, you call it the change maker playbook. Mm. So the playbook has some rules, but not many rules. And you mentioned mm. when you started out in the, in the 2008 campaign, there were three mm. rules. Mm -hmm. And particularly, of course, the no drama, which makes a lot of sense. But as mm. we look at an office and a day-to-day work, -day work mm. environment, my, there's a lot of drama mm. and gossip. I think the good thing in a new organization or a fresh organization is you, don't, you have less bad. Right. How would you deal with that in an organization you know, that's been decades or f even older, maybe even 100 mm. years or so old, to, to work around that? Because yeah. you know, the, the, the no drama becomes a lot more difficult in that world mm. versus in, the, in, a, in, 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 in an organization that has no baggage. Right. I think, you're, I think you make a good point. I mean, yeah, and from your change management experience too, I'm sure you've seen it where, you know, organizations that try to change, um, it's it's very difficult when you have a lot of history too. Yeah. Um, but I, I also think um, at the end of the day, I think if you can really uh, frame the new environment mm -hmm. for your team and then really try to learn together, I, the biggest thing, I think the, the thing I see the, um, that's most effective in organizations that are trying to get into this new game is building a learning environment. Mm -hmm. And once you start to learn together, um, you start to, um, I think, move into flow together. Yeah, I, I, I totally. Now, I want to use the last few minutes here sure. and talk about something very, very important that I really would like to get for you know viewers who watch to get yeah. out there. Mm -hmm. How do we live power to the people mm -hmm. and self empowerment? Because I think they're they're like two components. So one is mm -hmm. we need to feel we need to empower people so you, you feel that people are empowered to do things. And one mm -hmm. is to self empower yourself to claim your space and mm -hmm. claim your frame and right. go for it. What would you advise to, to people to do this? Yeah, but we're seeing it now happening. Even in just the last year or two, we've started to see how young people are ste stepping up, right? Mm -hmm. We're starting to see how uh, we see it with uh, the Me Too movement. We see it with Black mm -hmm. Lives Matter movement. We're starting to see more and more that people, we're starting to now move into this new game. What this is all about is we all want to be able to be on the same playing field together. It's about inclusion. It's about having systems that, and spaces that allow us to work together. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm seeing now that, uh, that we're doing this as a society very quickly. We're moving this direction. But it also means that all of us have to really, again, break sort of the first walls you have to tear, tear down are those walls uh, in your head. Right. Yes. So so <laughs> it really is about yeah. seeing the new game and knowing that I have to no one can be passive. Everyone has to be active. And uh, and then when you the second part of this is I, I love this rule, uh, love and respect in action. Mm. Change making ultimately is about love and respect in action. And so how we come together around problems and opportunities together, I think, is where the opportunity is. Mm, that's really great. I, I think this is this is really great. And I actually have another one to add. I sure. think what would be a good rule because we hear a lot of finger pointing and a lot mm. of complaining. I used to say in my work environment, if you complain, you can complain, but bring a solution. So right. you have both that Absolutely. parts of it, right? And I see more and more of that too, by the way. I see that organizations are encouraging people to come forward with solutions. Mm. Uh, and so, and it's, we're seeing it in our communities too. People are starting to now come forward. I think this is, look, this is been a tough time, but we've been incubating during this pandemic. We've been yeah. in our homes and, 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 we've been, uh, and we've been learning how to get through this. Now we have to figure out as we come out of this pandemic, mm -hmm. as we come back into society, how do we take all of our innovations and bring them forward together? That's mm -hmm. going to be the big challenge. Yeah, and one final word for our mm. viewers. If you want to jolt them out of complacency and become more the change maker, what would you tell them? Oh, empathy, teamwork, new leadership, change making. That's the whole new formula. There you heard it. A whole lot and really a great ending. Thanks so much, Henry, for being on. Thank you so much for watching. And please read up on this because we do have to become all change makers and everyone a leader in this new age with you know new rules to play. We see you next week. Have a good night.